is like really a signature of Joss's characters, you know, having one preconceived notion. I mean, Jay, when Gunn came on the show, people were like, oh, he's, he's kind of like an LA, like street thug, but actually, like there's this very strong yearning to work with Angel and to learn from Angel. And I just kind of want to know how you originally approached the character and then created Gunn into this like wonderful, intelligent, you know, man. Sophisticated. Sophisticated. <laughs> Wow, well, you know, it was a long process with the audition. Um, when I got it, I was really intimidated by it because he was supposed to be this sort of, you know, ghetto street youth, you know, kind of rough around the edges. And, you know, in life, I'm kind of different from that. Um, but I had just taken this really great acting class that taught me to really, you know, believe that these characters exist inside of me. So, I found a way to just connect to the character's yearning for family, because ultimately I thought that that's what he was looking for, and that's what he created amongst the homeless youth in LA. And then when he met Angel, you know, he was very anti-vampire, obviously. So somehow he was able to, <laughs> to put it mildly, <laughs> to put it mildly. But I thought that that was a really good arc about how sometimes like people who you decide are horrible people can sometimes surprise you and you can find common ground for a mutual you know result and i thought that that was the real beauty of the storyline in a lot of ways and so then when he got with these characters he found that he could form a family with them too and that they all had a mutual interest so that's kind of how I approached the character. I thought it was all about creating families. And, and that's exactly what happened off camera, you know, with, with us. Because I, you know, we've been friends all these years. The show's been over and, you know, we've been through awesome things. I was at this man's wedding. I've been through so many beautiful things. So, yeah, so it's interesting how sometimes, you know, art imitates life and life imitates art. It's circular, definitely. Um, you mentioned vampires, James. Let's let's skip down the line. Now, vampires on Buffy were supposed to be, you know, these evil, ugly, demon creatures, and here you come. The, <laughs> kind of the opposite. And you know what? You stuck around and you kept sticking around, and you know how how originally when you were approached for Spike, I mean, there was no telling the longevity of the character. You know, so originally, what was what was Spike's job on the show? Uh, to die. Right. <laughs> but you just he was, wouldn't. He was just Drusilla's boy toy for five episodes, and then he was going to be Angel's first victim. Uh, like the whole point of the season, this is over on the other show, was that <laughs> Buffy would, Buffy would uh, get her heart broken by Angel. They finally hook up, and then Angel would go evil, and then Buffy would really, really cry all the time, and then. <laughs> And uh, his first act of evil was to take me down. So they only built me up to be cool so that when Angel killed me, he would look awesome, right? <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, uh, he got, Joss got talked, like, J to his credit, I think Joss does not believe that evil is cool. He thinks that evil is laughable, and I agree. And uh, he, he, that's why his vampires were hideously ugly when we bite someone, because he doesn't want that to be a sensual kind of shot. Uh, and he got talked into one romantic vampire character, that was Angel. David Greenwald, bless his heart, talked him into that character, and then Angel just took it right off. And uh, I don't think that Spike was designed to be a romantic character. And I remember when, when uh, after a couple episodes, uh, the fan reaction was that I wasn't uh, romantic character. Joss backed me up against the wall and said, I don't care how popular you are, kid. You are dead. You're dead. And I was just like, it's your ball, dude. Like, whatever. Like, just don't kill me now. And, like, just give me the five episodes. I'm poor. You know? So, uh, yeah, so I, I uh, he told me that I was supposed to answer your question, Claire. So. No, no, go on, please. It's actually, it's my turn. I'm not giving the mic up. Yeah, uh, just quickly, uh, he, he said that, that I was a soulless vampire that didn't care about anybody. Uh, and, and I said, yeah, Josh, you got it, buddy. you got it. And he turned his back and I was like, that's that. Because, <laughs> uh, like, I've learned that as an actor, if you find the love 
you find the gold in the mountain, you find the jet fuel, you find the, the thing that will connect you to the audience. Like, what does your character love? And it could, it could be love denied, love crushed, or any kind of love, that's what's gonna connect. And I was like, well, I'm gonna find the love. And so I found it in Drusilla. And I actually started undercutting Joss's theme from the beginning. <laughs> And it's like you did job. I was a new father. And, and, and getting diapers overwhelmed anything, any respect I had for Joss. And was very baby baby health care. Um, I, I pretty much played Spike with the Soul from the very beginning, and that was wrong. That was wrong. But it was so right. It was right, guys? It was so right. Each of you guys had such interesting journeys. I mean, you went from kind of like a friendly, bubbly to brooding character. So let's talk a little bit about about Wesley's journey. Sure. I, I, did I? What was the question? You, you know. Or did I agree. I you mean, agree. Yeah. Right. Okay. Perfect. No, I really want to talk about the arc of your character. Oh, who, who yeah. come, you know, you were very no, much friendly, bubbly. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I didn't mean to. But um, first of all, I'm learning so much. Thank you. Everybody, it's, truly, it's so. Don't tell Josh. Like, we're like in our little, like, it's oh, shared. Oh, look YouTube, it's out. <laughs> we're in our bubbles, aren't we? And like, it's fascinating to hear what they were all going through while I was thinking about myself. <laughs> I, um, you know, I'd love to tell you that this was that it was all kind of mapped out, but I didn't get five months of it too. So I, I can't say that I started that thinking, uh, having big thoughts about the journey. I, I guess this is how I think of all of these jobs, is that I, I just try to make small, I just try to take a small step. And in a funny way, all those small steps, in, in my case, added up to an enormously long journey that I'm very grateful for. Um, I think, um, I think, I think if each little step works, then you get to take the next one. I, I, I don't really know how else to. It's to a good metaphor that. for life, too, isn't I it? I guess, yeah, I guess so, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But, um, yeah, I think the writers, you know, they, they had such a gift for, it was such a dialogue, and I don't even mean an off screen dialogue, I mean an on screen dialogue. Like they'd throw something up, and then and then they'd see the day, they'd be like, oh, it's kind of working. Try that for a bit, and then and, and it and it kind of some of it's that, and then some of it are these grand strokes that are intended from the beginning uh, of either the show or the beginning of the seasons um, to try to, to try to get into. I, one thing I wanted to add was I, in preparation for today, I watched Spin the Bottle season season four, my least favorite season. <laughs> Did we get to play Spin the Bottle? We can! Karate! <laughs> it's one of my favorite episodes with you. And I remember there was this scene, it was between you two, where uh, you said to him, what's going on with you, dude? You've changed, you're different. And your character says, I got my throat slit and my friends abandoned me. And that was a pivotal moment, I think, for your character as well, where you really went dark. Yeah, and, and you do it so well. <laughs> it's, it was really fun to see you in the pilot, not the pilot, but when you first came over and, you know, he was fumbling around, he had the big, uh, do you remember that, do you remember when we were in the office and yeah. he had the big axe and it went into the wall and you were like, oops, you know, like it was so you know, the coffee beans. I remember, the our, I remember our kids. <laughs> We decide to bang our teeth against each other. And I, I, just, I still laugh, but like I think and back to that. Like, it kind kidding. of hurt. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this isn't Sorry, working. Sorry, digressing. Well, we didn't have those problems. <laughs> Amazing. 
amazing opportunity as an actress to get to transition, you know, from, from Fred to this completely badass, like, totally different character. What, when, when they pitched that to you, what, what was your initial thoughts and did you have any trepidation? Ooh, well, initially when Joss pitched it to me, he did like a pretty typical Joss thing where he said, I just wanted you to know I'm killing Fred. And then I waited a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, but I'm just gonna bring him back as a demon goddess, and I was like, what? No one's gonna argue about that. <laughs> but he gave us a lot of time sort of to lead into that. He gave he gave Alexis and I some scenes. Maybe I feel like it was at your wedding, right? <laughs> it was, yeah. <laughs> cheerful. He gave us Very cheerful. Scenes at his wedding. <laughs> we, so that was the child never stops working. <laughs> earlier in the year, and so we, I had about three months knowing that this transition was happening, and Joss had in his kitchen, Joss likes to dance a lot, and he had in his kitchen different colored lights for dance yeah. parties. <laughs> I think they were for dance parties, maybe it was for <laughs> Just cooking. Uh, just cause. <laughs> did these scenes that weren't ever in the show. But right. They were just scenes he had written and we kind of worked the character, which this is something you never get to do in any television job. You usually just show up and hope that you made the right choice. So, um, so yeah, we got to workshop the whole character and he was flipping the colors on the lights and we tried it with red and then we tried it with blue and he was like, oh, you're gonna be blue. <laughs> and so that's how the look of the lyric was born. In Joss's kitchen, there's some blue lights. I love it. Yeah. That's great. James, you have some of the best one-liners on the show. Do you have any that stick out to you? Any favorites? Okay. <laughs> this is, you want the truth? Or do you want the... Okay, okay. This, the, the truth we, we is I don't truth. remember anything. <laughs> okay, no, no. This is the thing. This is the thing. When you're working 12 to 15 hours a day, and you're doing 22 episodes a year, I discovered levels of fatigue I had no idea existed. And my short-term memory evaporated. And I remember we used to play a game on the set, which is, quick, what did we film this morning? Like that. And, and the, the response would be like, I got nothing. I had no idea. Never remember even what we did a few hours before because you're always really focused on what you're doing now, trying to live up to these scripts that are so well written and you know no matter how hard you try, you're never going to be as good as what's on the page. You're always going to miss something. So, um, like you guys got, you guys were probably much better rested when you were in contact with Angel than we were. <laughs> Uh, and so I, like, it's Let's not... Let's hear one of your favorite one-liners. Like, <laughs> While he waffles. Anybody got one? We puppet man! You're a wee bloody puppet there man! There we go. That's, 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 that's one of my favorites. Yeah, I don't remember that one. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to open it up to questions. Yeah. So there's two mics in the aisles, and you guys can line up there. And while they're getting lined up, Charisma, I want to ask you, um, your final scene in season four, obviously before you came back, but where, where you and Angel are in the office and, and the phone rings and you say, oh, and you're welcome. How was that to film and how, how did you bring, you almost brought the original Cordelia back to that one line at the end. It was so interesting. Actually, that is interesting because the way I said it, they had me re-say it in ADR because they didn't like the way I had delivered it. They wanted it to not be given away. So when I was playing the scene, I guess I had indicated in a way, like if I were to describe the, the way I said it, it would be like sharing the loss. You know, like, I don't even want to give you the reading, but whatever reading it was, it was like sharing the loss. Like I was sad, like I knew what was coming and they didn't want it to be given away. So I'm in ADR delivering the line again, and I'm kind of at odds with the producer in, in post. I'm like, I don't want to say it like that. I want to be all, oh, and you're welcome, 
You know, it's like that doesn't fit. That doesn't work for me. And that just feels intrinsically wrong. And, you know, as usual, I was wrong. And, and they prevailed. And they're like, this is really the way that we want it. Want to do it because we don't want the audience to know. Go, okay, well that makes sense. So I, I'll, I'll do it that way. But my instincts were, you know, to go darker, to 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 feel, <laughs> you know, to feel like the loss of having like. Thick. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was extremely poignant how it ended up. So good job. Thanks. Hi. We're gonna start over here. Hi.